This video is sponsored by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit delivery service. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your door, with easy-to-follow instructions that make cooking at home simple and affordable. With over 35 weekly recipes, you can personalize your meals to your lifestyle choices, choose calorie-smart and carb-smart recipes, or even customize select meals by swapping and adding specific ingredients. As longtime viewers know, I am anemic, and a specific diet is important to my health and general recovery, and I'm often far too tired to be able to go grocery shopping myself. With HelloFresh, I don't have to worry about figuring out my meals or going to the store, and in fact, HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout, and the ingredients travel from the farm to you in less than seven days, meaning they're fresh too. To try HelloFresh, just click the link below for 21 free meals plus free shipping. Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring, and I hope you all enjoy the video. Horror as a genre in games truly began to take off in the late 1990s, when the Sony PlayStation saw dozens of unique experimental titles in the genre, from little-known games like Galerians and Kodelka, to more famous titles like Resident Evil and Silent Hill. Survival horror, as it was coming to be known, was beginning to develop into a broad, expansive genre, with its own tools and traditions, large enough to have smaller subgenres of its own. The 90s saw the explosion of many types of horror focused on many different opponents. The serial killers of Clock Tower, the dinosaurs of Dino Crisis, the aliens of Parasite Eve. We've seen zombies and monsters, psychics and demons, but there was one kind of creature that had yet to have its moment center stage, the ghost. Sure, ghosts had appeared in games as enemies in Mario titles and countless RPGs, but ghosts as we imagine them in horror, as already dead, nigh indestructible entities, had yet to exist in games. The horror games that existed at the time were skewed towards one cultural influence and one style, Western, due to the heavy influence of Western horror films and books on the genre. But in the early 2000s, a game would arrive that would change both these things, opening the door for new kinds of horror influences and styles. A game that was designed solely with two ideas in mind. A Japanese setting, as opposed to a Western one, and a story centered on facing the spirit world. It was the joint creation of two young men, up-and-coming developers at what was then known as Tecmo, who would find their mutual visions for a new game lined up perfectly. Together, alongside their team, they would create the first game in what would become a series that would last decades, known in North America as Fatal Frame. Kikuchi Kisuke was born in the early 1970s, likely in the Shizuoka Prefecture of Japan, where he attended high school, taking an early interest in mathematics that led him to attend the Tokyo University of Science. Graduating in 1994, he was quickly hired by Tecmo at around the same time as another young man. This man was Shibata Makoto from Nomi in Ishikawa, he attended school at the University of Toyama in the prefecture of the same name, and would graduate and be hired by Tecmo around the exact same time as Kikuchi, leading to the two young men sharing a training group as newcomers to the company. It was how they met, but not how they would come to work together. Shibata's career would begin in games testing on titles like Mega Man Legends, while Kikuchi's role as a programmer would see him working on Tecmo Super Bowl III. But it wouldn't be long before they were reunited. Likely sometime in late 1994 or early 95, the two would be assigned to work on the first title in what would become a long-running Tecmo series, 
Deception. A game centered upon the usage of traps to defeat your enemies, it was a first-person story-driven game about taking revenge, and its popularity would see multiple sequels in the late 90s through the 2000s. It was this game that would see Kikuchi Kisuke and Shibata Makoto working together for the first time. Kikuchi was a central programmer on the first two games, and project manager on the third, while Shibata would start as planner, before moving to main planner and then director for the third game. They were each rising in authority and responsibility, with their roles mirroring one another's, requiring a great deal of teamwork and close contact between the two men. They were partners in crime, and the success of the series they were working on propelled them upward in their careers. It was during this time that both men began to play with ideas for future game projects. During his time working on Deception, Kikuchi spent a lot of time researching architecture. It was a series about setting traps in large environments, styled after western medieval castles. He'd wanted to use Japanese architecture and research the topic, and Shibata had even prepared and sent in proposals for Deception games set in Japanese locales. But they found the style was too stylized, too detailed for the PlayStation to emulate. The blocky, grey castle walls of western history were just easier to create. But Kikuchi and Shibata both found the research compelling. Shibata had books full of reference material, and the two of them didn't forget their desire to create a game set in Japan's historical houses. Shibata Makoto really wanted to make a horror game, something that made you feel true fear. He'd fallen in love with horror somewhat late in his life, due to a unique childhood. If you ask the man, he's happy to tell you that he used to see ghosts. From a very young age, he was haunted by supernatural visitors, until he grew older and the visitations and dreams suddenly stopped. Free of his hauntings, the horror genre no longer terrified him as it once had, when ghosts were very real to him. Suddenly the genre became nostalgic, reminding him of past times during his childhood. He fell in love with horror, developing an obsession and understanding of the concept that would lead his career. Now we have to take a moment to step back and discuss the concept of ghosts. In Japan, the central cultural and spiritual tradition, Shintoism, is built upon the concept of spirits. It is quite literally a religious belief, one of the most common in the country. While not everyone believes in actual ghostly visitations, it's far from uncommon to hear of believers. To hear tale of people who've seen ghosts, or told stories of others who have. There are plenty of interviews about Shibata's experience in Japanese in which the others involved express surprise, but not disbelief, anger, or confusion. So I was surprised when my previous Fatal Frame video discussing these events received some real anger and accusations thrown at Shibata Makoto, calling him a liar and manipulator, accusing him of lying to sell the game, which is ludicrous for many reasons we'll eventually get to. For now, suffice to say this, refuting a Japanese man's belief in spirits and accusing him of fraud is foolish at best, ignorant at its worst. And it's not impossible to believe what another person believes they experienced while doubting the supernatural elements of said experiences for yourself. So Shibata Mikoto had spent his childhood surrounded by spirits, and once they left him, he found he was fascinated by them, and by horror as a genre, which eventually developed into the desire to make a horror game. A ghost horror game, of course, an idea that he pitched to his friend Kikuchi somewhat early on, likely during their time on Deception 3. When they first began developing their concept, the PlayStation 2 had yet to be released, so they had to work with the idea their project would release on the PlayStation. This meant heavy usage of CG, since Shibata couldn't imagine creating truly frightening ghosts without the more powerful imagery of computer graphics. He had very specific ideas of what they should look like. He'd seen them before, after all, and his goal was to recreate his own spiritual experiences as close as possible, to allow those who couldn't see the spirit world to experience what it was to be haunted. 
Then the PS2 was announced, a brand new console with far more power than its predecessor, and it seemed the stars had aligned. This console would be powerful enough to truly express the vagueness of ghosts, as Shibata described them. The Emotion Engine was capable of creating graphics that until then had been restricted to CG cutscenes, allowing the player to walk through a nightmarish world of spirits. This new project required a new team, but many of its members were from the previous Deception team. Besides Kikuchi and Shibata, at least ten of them worked on Deception 3, including the men who would become Fatal Frame's central programmer and character design director. In their previous projects, the duo had used frightening things alongside more entertaining comedic elements to create the atmosphere of deception. It wasn't truly a horror game, but an action game with horror elements. Eventually, the two considered what it might be like to create a pure horror game, an idea that likely originated from Shibata. Kikuchi and Shibata decided to set aside the Deception series for a time, to create a new project for this new console, centered upon their two desires, a game using Japanese historical architecture and spirits. They would be starting from nothing, and so the new project was given the working title of Project Zero. It started with a conversation about fear. Kikuchi asked Shibata, the horror fan between the two of them, what was the most frightening thing? He answered, people's imaginations. As a child, he was far more frightened of what he couldn't see than what he could. He would tell a story as an example, describing a time his friend invited him to see the ring, which his friend claimed was terrifying. While waiting to see it, Shibata built the film up in his mind as something truly horrific. Too afraid to see it, he and his friend decided to see a different movie. And that night, Shibata had the scariest nightmare he'd ever had. True fear comes from what people imagine in their head, how they work themselves up over what could be there, rather than what is there. While Kikuchi wasn't a big fan of horror or fear, once he took on the project, he knew they had to go farther to do more than had been done before. You could emulate what books and movies did in the genre, but if all you did was create something frightening to look at, it would be meaningless to consider it a game. In Kikuchi's words, they had to make it so that the player would be scared to touch the controller. That was the starting point for Zero. Shibata would develop the design document, which was in part revealed almost two decades later during a talk he gave at the third Nico Nico Games Conference. The document presented their world of the game, a historical Japanese mansion, a third of which had actually been modernized into a more Western-style building, an idea that would prove too ambitious for the team. The idea behind the mansion was simple. Japanese historical buildings are structured in a way that's more frightening. In addition, it matched his goal of creating the ultimate frightening game. Since the audience was Japanese, he felt that a game that felt close to home, rather than imagining a horror happening in a country far away, would be far scarier for his audience. In his lecture on the subject, Shibata joked about being terrified of his parents' house, telling his audience to explore their own ancestral homes to understand how frightening they are. Large, empty spaces, sliding doors that are partially see-through, structures that cast all kinds of shadows. The style of the building itself lends itself well to fear in the way it emphasizes shadow and emptiness. The game would use a grainy and faded appearance pulled from films from the 1970s, and alongside the use of a flashlight, would create a different experience compared to most of the clear-edged, clean PS2 games released at the time. It would make full use of the PS2's graphic ability and its stereophonic sound, allowing the player to experience what it's like to be inside a haunted house. The document also presented the ghosts as enemies, explaining them as spiritual beings who weren't truly to be defeated so much as struggled against. They were not villains or monsters, per se. They are the departed, 
who are already dead and can't be killed again. The idea was very different compared to other horror games of the time, but Project Zero had some luck on its side. This was the early years of the horror boom that saw Japanese horror and ghost stories in particular taking the country and the world by storm. It wasn't so strange to imagine a Japanese ghost as an enemy after the popularity of Sadako and the horrors of the grudge. That was really Shibata's goal, to recreate the experience of a Japanese ghost movie. The problem was, of course, that in these kinds of films, the ghosts often don't directly appear until the last act. Their game would have to have a lot more spirits, and a system to interact with and combat them, and that was a hurdle they would struggle with. The original design document explains Shibata's original idea. The camera. Referred to as the Ghost Capture System, this design was meant to capture ghosts via taking pictures, stealing their energy in the photograph. The idea had multiple origins. In the East, photographs and cameras have long been associated with the occult, and there are multiple folk stories that claim cameras can steal your spirit. Spirit photography itself had been popular in Japan for a few decades before, and most of all, the camera required the players to look at the ghosts. It was to be a game that specializes in scares at all costs, one that would be easy to operate and provide a truly scary experience, appealing to the average person and the avid horror fan. One weakness of horror from this time was the fact that the monsters and enemies had to be run from. Even in games like Resident Evil, the gameplay emphasizes keeping your distance and staying away from the creatures as much as possible to survive. The player is never really made to face and engage with monsters head on. In Shibata's concept, the player would not only have to look at the ghosts, but even wait with bated breath for the right moment to engage with them, essentially forcing them to stand still and let the ghost come to them while looking directly at them. The game concept was approved, and Shibata would later credit multiple reasons for why his strange and unique idea managed to leap that first hurdle. The early 2000s were a great time for horror in the East and West, with Ring and Juan coming from Japan, and the Blair Witch Project making waves from the other side of the ocean. These films would become phenomenons in their home countries and abroad, revealing how explosive and popular horror projects could be, especially horror with ghosts. In the game world, it was Silent Hill's success that Shibata Makoto credits with his game getting the green light. Silent Hill had been a 3D game, using polygon-created horrors in Shibata's words, which players really enjoyed. That success paved the way for his ambitious proposal, but not every element of said proposal was accepted without critique. Kikuchi Kisuke's first thought upon seeing the document was, Seriously? He was clearly surprised, and not entirely sold on its every idea. But he did feel one element was solid. Japanese houses were well suited to horror. He felt the two of them could create a game scarier than anything the world had seen before with this idea. The horror of Japanese houses, described in Shibata's own words. Japanese houses are spaces that have their own unique charm, divided by fragile materials such as wood and paper doors. There are lots of hiding places, behind folding screens, under the floor, atop the crisscrossing beams, on the other side of a lattice. A warm darkness resides everywhere. Japanese houses are made from living materials. It seems to me the emotions of the people who have been there have seeped into these wooden Japanese houses. When I immerse myself in that darkness, I feel as though the memories of the deceased are secretly whispering to me. As you explore the rooms thoroughly, wondering what happened there, I want you to listen out for whispers from the darkness. Together the two would create a story and world from their design document, 
It started with imagining what would be frightening in a Japanese house, what kind of events or ghosts would be scariest. And from the countless ideas they had, they trimmed down and cleaned up the best into a working concept. The central idea, the focus on a ritual gone wrong, would draw from Japanese folklore in a roundabout way. Shibata came up with it, but it wasn't from researching Japanese history. It was from reading manga, specifically Morohoshi Daijiro's Yokai Hunter series. Nearly every creative in the horror field in Japan, particularly those who grew up in the 70s through to the 90s, mention Morohoshi as an influence on their work. He is a seminal manga artist and storyteller, whose adaptations of Japanese folktales and myths into modern mystery and horror stories took hold of a generation of readers. One story, Visitor of Darkness, would become the starting point for Shibata's own narrative in Fatal Frame. Sometime later, Morohoshi himself would apparently recognize the similarity. While developing this story, they also came upon a realization about their time period. The story originally was set in the modern age, until the team realized that setting it further back in time would reinforce the sense of fear. In the modern age, there are multiple ways to connect to the world. Computers, telephones, pagers, all kinds of devices. By setting the game in the 1980s, before the widespread usage of such things, they could make the player feel even more isolated and alone. Kikuchi Kisuke was still uneasy about their project for two reasons. They wanted the game to appeal to a large audience, which meant the difficult balancing game of making a horror that's not too horrific. But more importantly, Kikuchi was not a fan of the camera. He didn't understand why it would be considered a weapon, and others on the team and at Tecmo agreed with him. So other options were explored by multiple members of the team. The character designer, Hasegawa Hitoshi, originally imagined the main character is wielding magic in one hand and a sword in the other. Traditional Japanese exorcism tools such as Ofuda talismans and sacred Hamaya arrows were imagined as weapons as well. Even a vacuum, similar to Luigi's Mansion, stunning them with the light of a flashlight, or using a magic shouting skill that pushed ghosts away with your voice were considered as weapons. None of them really worked. Kikuchi felt the system had to include an attack on the ghosts with some kind of weapon, or else it wouldn't really feel like an exorcism. Cameras aren't intuitive. People understand swords or bows. They make sense as weapons. But the idea of a camera being used to attack doesn't immediately make sense to the average person. But nothing else was working, and Shibata was insistent on his camera concept. He would later theorize that the camera resonated with him so much because of a childhood experience, related, of course, to his experiences with ghosts. As a child in his room at night, he would hear voices on the road outside his house, as if a parade of spirits were walking by, Concepts similar to the Hayaki Yagyo, or Demon Parade of Japanese myth, Shibata was too afraid to look outside his window and see if anything was there. But sometime later, his father gave him an old broken camera, and he theorized that maybe it would be safe to look if it was through the medium of the viewfinder. It was this memory that returned to him years later, working on Project Zero. In an attempt to explain his ideas, Shibata described the concept to his team as Resident Evil meets Pokemon Snap. Apparently, he was half-joking, but the comparison stuck. Eventually, he went so far as to make a mock-up of his idea, presenting it as a style of gun combat that could only shoot a single bullet at a time. He wanted their combat to be built on the idea of staying up close until the last second, withstanding the fear and defeating it and only the camera could truly implement that idea. The camera obscura, as it was known in the West, became the game's weapon. In Japanese, it would be known as the shaeki, or shadow-destroying device. The name was meant to sound a bit dated and foreign, putting it in a specific time period, the Meiji and Edo periods, when Japan was importing foreign devices and technology. They used countless references of real devices of that kind when designing their own camera, 
which was based on a real camera, the German Linhof 5x4, but it was remodeled to suit the game's atmosphere and give it a more Japanese feeling. It was designed to be a folding camera, so it would make sense that the player could walk around and carry it easily. The history and development of the camera was originally part of the plot, but it would have to be cut for time. Once they had their weapon, they had to have ghosts to face, and those ghosts had to have a system of combat of their own. That role would fall to Yuchi Suyoshi, a planner on the team and the man credited with designing the combat. Iuchi Suyoshi began his gaming career in 1997. From 1999 to 2003, he lists himself as a game director at UNIT, while simultaneously he worked as a planner at Tecmo starting in 2002. That timeline is a little murky. Whatever the dates, Iuchi would be a planner and central designer behind the combat of the first game, as well as one of the few to assist in writing the scenarios of the series. He describes his own role as being mainly in charge of the scenarios and texts of the first three games. A central concern for Iuchi during the first game was the unique compositions of their enemies. Monsters and zombies are inherently physical and frightening. They have a weight and physicality to them that makes it easy to convey why they are a threat. Ghosts don't have bodies at all, and they're no longer human in the normal sense. How do you convey a sense of danger from something that's essentially made of air? It all came down to how the ghosts died, considering what brought them to their death, what they might want that would keep them trapped here, and how those desires would be reflected in their body, their movements, their voice. By the end of the project, Uichi says he could imagine in my head how each one had died. He carefully considered every element of their appearance and movement, differentiating how certain ghosts appeared, disappeared, moved, and attacked. Each ghost had a personality, something that would leave an impression, and that was Iuchi's goal, to have the player viscerally react to the ghost with a sensation that it was disgusting, or pitiful, or awful. Broken Neck, one of the more infamous ghosts, can drop from above in a similar way to the manner of her death. Iuchi called this the catcher attack, referring to UFO catchers, similar to western claw machines. Each of Iuchi's ghosts were meant to be more than one-dimensional, to have multiple patterns of movements and attacks. For difficulty levels, the movements and locations of some ghosts would change, their attack speed sometimes increasing. His ultimate hope for his ghosts was that during the game, players would listen to their words and use them to understand their dying wishes. Kikuchi Kisuke would remain skeptical and uneasy about the camera combat until the system started to take shape. Everything in the world inside Shibata's head was complete, he would later say, and I couldn't get him to change one thing. There may have been a reason why Shibata's world was so complete, and he was so against changing any part of it. It comes from the fact that he quite literally dreamed it. Sometime before and during the production of the project, Shibata began to dream of exploring a Japanese house full of ghosts, from the first-person perspective, while carrying a camera. The house, the ghosts, the weapon, all of it came from his detailed dreams, and Shibata was very determined to keep those central elements the same as his personal experiences. But there were things that had to be changed. The game couldn't be in first person all the time. Instead, it was a balance of third and first. This was to keep the fear tense at all times. In third person, your view of what is ahead and behind is limited, and the fear that something might be about to attack the character on screen rises, and you feel the loneliness of the image of a young girl in this nightmare scenario. In the first person, however, you have to look at the nightmares head-on, and by switching the two situations, 
the player can't become entirely used to or complacent with either of them. The game was taking shape, and the visual world was being built brick by brick. To do this, the team was instructed by the one team member who could claim to have seen ghosts, and who instructed them as to how to recreate the feeling of seeing them. In fact, when Kikuchi asked Shibata how they were going to imagine their ghosts, he enigmatically told him, will create the ones I saw in my dreams. The ghosts of Shibata's experiences in and out of dreamland were blurry, fuzzy things, distorted and faceless, with a very intense, unique aura he was determined to recreate. Those of you who have seen spirits will understand, he would say later in an interview. There's something called the atmosphere where spirits seem to come out and creating this atmosphere was one of the most difficult elements of the game. His ultimate goal in creating the ghosts was the hope that one day another believer might approach him and say his ghosts were a faithful recreation of what believers experienced while seeing the supernatural. Much later he would be approached by other believers, who would tell him he was very close, but his spirits moved too fast. He was just happy to have gotten something right. Three key elements were focused on, lighting, movement, and silence. To recreate the density of the air during a ghost appearance, they used sounds that are impossible for humans to perceive, so that it seems like the scene is silent when it's not. Then there was the humidity, created by a careful balance of the amount of light and darkness, and the film grain that would be depicted on screen along with a carefully balanced movement speed for both the player and the spirits, they were able to create an environment that felt frightening and tense, even when the player was merely walking around. Shibata himself created this balance alongside a team member he credits as the programmer in one interview, possibly referring to Fatal Frame's chief programmer and former Deception team member, Toshiyuki Takasaki. Shibata and the programmer carefully conferred with one another as to how to create the atmosphere Shibata was looking for, making small adjustments to the sounds, the visual grain, and the brightness to every scene, late into the project's development. Eventually, they created a set of 20 to 30 variations of effects out of 20 to 30,000 possibilities spread throughout the game. Toshiyuki Takasaki started his career as a programmer at Tecmo in 1993. He worked on Gallop Racer before becoming part of the Deception team, which would lead to his role as the central programmer for Frame. He was heavily involved in the general programming, but also programmed the visual effects of the ghosts, something he was very concerned about. Being inanimate and dead, ghosts don't have to move like living things or animate objects. The team behind their movements and visual effects remained conscious of the inorganic element, combining the corpse-like stiffness and slowness with the human emotions ghosts are capable of to create a terrifying blend of the dead and living. The team was constantly talking over the ghosts and how to depict them, tweaking and redoing them over and over again. Once they felt they had it, they still struggled with slowdown and technical issues caused by the amount of visual effects being used, and had to start trimming it down. Rains and static, color loss, darkness and brightness, all of these were carefully balanced to create a unique experience for each and every ghost. But while these ghosts were meant to be terrifying, there was also something alluring about them. After all, if they were too disgusting, the player could hardly empathize with them. These dead were lost souls, not villains or soulless corpses. They were people. The team wanted the player to want to help the spirits. Toshiyuki would go so far as to hope the players wouldn't just be terrified. If you happen to find yourself with even the slightest respite from the approaching fear, please also take a look at their beauty. In total, the game would have about 65 different possible instances of combat with ghosts, and an additional 45 ghostly occurrences possible in the background. The game was taking shape. They had their locale, they had their enemies, and the visual look of the world was coming together. But there was still a major concern to be faced. The color palette. 
Shibata had long since named old-fashioned films, particularly war films, as visual inspirations, drawing from them the grainy, faded analog look the director was looking for. But how far was too far? Originally, the game was done entirely in shades of black and white. It was intense, creating stark contrasts. Black and white were the colors of the game, white as light and hope, while the black represented darkness and fear. This is how it was described by a member of the team, Hasegawa Zin Hitoshi. Officially credited as Zin, with the role of character design director, interviews and behind-the-scenes information reveals the amount of work Hasegawa was involved in, which included not only character design, but heavy involvement in the CG of the game and the development of the game's light and shadow. If it was too dark, the player couldn't see to move forward, too bright, and it wasn't frightening. Hasegawa hadn't realized how detailed the job would be. Shadows were shadows, right? But Shibata showed him how nuanced and detailed the shadows could be, and over time the two perfected the balance of black to white, shadow to light in the game. The team eventually realized that this balance was thrown off in a fully black and white world. It made the experience very intense. It caused slowdown, which led the ghost to use more jerky, violent, sudden motions, which made it much, much more frightening. It was enough to make both the producer and director react with fear, and they'd realized they'd gone too far. The black and white theme, however, wouldn't disappear. Instead, it was repurposed for specific scenarios in the game, those set in the past. The prologue and flashbacks to various events would use the original color palette, while the rest of the game would use a very dark and faded, but multi-tone set of colors. Hasegawa Zin Hitoshi graduated from the Tokyo Design College in 1995 and began his gaming career at ADK in April of that year, working on 2D fighting games. But it wasn't the best time to be entering that field. Downsizing at Neo Geo led Hasegawa to reconsider his future, and he pivoted towards 3D graphics. He was hired by Tecmo in January of 1999, and was a member of the Deception team before working on Fatal Frame. He was still young, and his role, character design, deceptively uninvolved, but a story he'd tell years later may reveal just how he became so much more involved in the game's design alongside another young member of the team, Shidara Masahiro. Shidara was another artist, inspired to the career from an event in his youth when a picture he'd drawn won a contest. Considering what to do professionally, he remembered that prize and thought about majoring in art. In high school, he studied architecture as a hobby, and in college would spend time at his school's computer labs tinkering with CG and attending lectures on the subject. He would join Tecmo in 1999, working as the art director for Gallop Racer before moving to Fatal Frame. Both Shidara and Hasegawa were young and early in their careers when they were both assigned to the same department on the same game, and they became friends. They were constantly finding themselves frustrated with how their superiors handled things, or at least Hasegawa was, he remembers, wondering if his youth was what made him so easily irritated at the time. It led to the two of them taking on more work so they could handle it their own way, and the more they proved their merit, the more responsibility they were given. By their mid-twenties, both would be project managers, and it's possible that it was the first fatal frame that led to that leap for these men. In fact, a story from Shidara Masahiro may line up with this story of Hasegawa's. Shidara tells the story of a time when he was working on a game and was in charge of the UI, and he wasn't happy with the battle system his seniors had created. Note that Shidara's official role for Fatal Frame was interface designer, and Fatal Frame is certainly a game that struggled to find its footing with combat. Frustrated with his superior's efforts, he apparently worked with a senior programmer a year older than himself, and they made their own prototype of a combat system that involved charged shots. 
His story doesn't specifically say camera combat, but Fatal Frame uses a system that includes holding the shot to charge it up and do more damage. Shidara says their system was adopted. He was then invited to every meeting of planning staff, though he was a designer, not a planner, and was suddenly entrusted with work that was beyond my capacity. It was a learning curve, however, for Shidara. It was the first time he'd been entrusted with so much, and he was hesitant to hand that responsibility away once he had it. It took time for him to learn he could delegate work to his team, and he mentions being hospitalized twice during his time at Tecmo, in the midst of projects which was devastating to him. But he feels he became a better worker afterward by learning not to take everything on his own shoulders. One of the most important elements of their game would be sound. The PlayStation 2 had new capabilities that the team planned to put to use. Specifically, stereophonic sound, or multi-directional sound, which recreates the sensation of sounds coming from in front, to the side, or behind you. This would allow the team to have noises and effects which seem to come from different directions, making the game not only seem more realistic, but more terrifying. It was a major focus for the sound team, which included Okuda Shigekiyo, credited as Okuda in the game, as well as Toyota Ayako, a female team member, as well as two more pseudonyms, Saito and Not M. Saito is likely Saito Atsuo, a team member who would return for the game's sequel. After testing multiple third-party tools for their game, the team settled on Arnis Sound Technologies due to its ability to make the sound on both sides seem like it was moving in 3D. The high quality of the sound effects and this stereophonic sound combined to make the listener truly feel as if they were there, hearing someone moving, or something breathing, just behind them. Shibata worked closely with the sound team, giving feedback and requesting additional sounds throughout the project. He would later recall a time the man in charge of the sound turned to look behind him while he was playing the game himself. I'll never forget his face of, Damn it, Shibata said. I fell into the trap I set myself. The director gave very specific directions on the sound, especially relating to the timing. A lot of the sounds they sampled were from foreign CDs, foreign sound effects rather than Japanese, to create a more alien feeling. The team found that sounds without meaning were often the most frightening, and were careful to spread out effects that were unrelated and even distant from the player, implying that there were things moving even outside their view. These sounds were added close to the end of development. The voices of the ghosts were actually recorded by Shibata himself. He did his best to instruct the team as to how the ghosts and their atmosphere should sound, drawing on his personal experiences, but he had a hard time getting them to understand. He'd tell them things like, remember the saddest thing that's ever happened to you, or feel bitter about everything in the world, as a guideline to creating sound. Eventually, the team recorded Shibata imitating the voices of the spirits he'd heard as a child, and those imitations were used in the game. In fact, there's even a sound the team says wasn't meant to be in the game at all. A ghostly voice which appeared over top the character's voice line and couldn't be removed. If you listen closely, you can still hear it. But what were they going to name their project? Kikuchi Kisuke's original title for the game was Rekoku, a word that means ruthless or cold-hearted in Japanese, but another game released using that title before they could use it. Kikuchi went back to the drawing board, considering over 200 options from multiple languages, including Japanese, English, German, and French, and eventually, he came back to the original project's working title, Zero. 
Zero is a number which represents something that doesn't exist. It represents nothingness. Ghosts, too, are something made of nothing, and so the two were semantically matched in Kikuchi's mind. The symbol for Zero became their game's title. The symbol for Zero and the symbol for Ghost can both be read as Rei in Japanese, creating a powerful association between the two concepts. They had a name, they had a world, they had a combat system, yet they still didn't have the pivotal point, a main character. Creating the central person was a struggle early on, one that the team solved by using the silhouette of a character in place of a playable character. For months into the project, they still didn't know who their heroine would be. It would be a woman that much Shibata knew, but unlike the rest of the game experience, he hadn't felt who that woman would be. In his dreams, he saw the mansion and its ghosts in first person. He couldn't see the person walking around. In his waking hours, he had a hard time figuring out just who would be the kind of person to go to a haunted mansion willingly. Eventually, Shibata created a design document describing the character's history, personality, and some desired physical features, which he handed to character designer Hasegawa as a guideline for their heroine. Hasegawa had a hard time imagining who this character would be at first. Typically, he could use a weapon as a kind of starting point. A swordsman has a traditional look, versus a gunman, and so on. But this game was using a camera. There was no artistic tradition to follow. No reference to look at beyond Shibata's handwritten notes. Hasegawa approached the project with a desire to balance fear and realness. If the character looked too cartoonish or fake, it would be hard to empathize and feel her fear. But they had to look a little fantastical to keep from being boring and dull. According to the design document, she should be young, slender, and female, because of Shibata's belief, and the larger Shinto traditions it stemmed from, that associated youth and femininity with spiritual power. A young, slender character would look like she had a strong sixth sense, in Shibata's words. She was made to look younger than her actual age, but she also needed to have a shadow. She had trauma in her past. The design outline said she should have impressive eyes, big, wet, black eyes to reflect her ephemeral sense, and she should have a strong core in her gaze since she's the protagonist. Her hair was to be long, down to her back, to show her spiritual power, another association with Shinto tradition. But because she hated her power, she would tie up her hair, she would have an important hair ornament, held up in an asymmetrical hairstyle. This style wouldn't work in the final product, as the style looked off when examined in the mirror in-game. But the hairpiece remained. It originally had story significance as a spiritual device handed down in the main character's family, but these details were cut for time. Another detail was her necklace, a black choker, which would have two purposes. Shibata wanted her to share an element of her design with her brother, a character who was already designed, and it foreshadowed a certain element of the game's plot, the rope curse. The color scheme would become white, black, and red, with red acting as a highlight, hinting at the themes of blood and life in the game. In addition, these three colors are the colors of Shinto, giving them spiritual significance to a Japanese audience. Early character designs were entirely dark black, but it made the protagonist too difficult to see, so they went back to the drawing board. One of the original designs was an intricate gothic outfit in a Taisho Roman style, during a time when the game was set even further back in the past than it would eventually be. This version saw the protagonist dressed head to toe in indigo velvet, with a long skirt lined with lace and cords and inner layers of red. A second, more modern option was designed, and it was this design that was tweaked to eventually become the look of Miku. Her name comes from her color, the red highlight that appears in her design. While he didn't know what she looked like, Shibata had decided her name early on. 
However, the word isn't traditionally used as a name in Japan. It threw a lot of the team off. But once again, Shibata stuck to his guns, and eventually the name Miku caught on. She would also have multiple unlockable costumes. The Ganguro outfit came from Hasegawa, the gothic Lolita was Shibata's idea, and the orange shirt costume was Kikuchi's. Once she was designed, she could finally exist in the game world, and her movements in that world would be the work of the motion designers, including designer Shimizu Katsuyuki. The main character's motions are what players see most of all. If they look wrong or exaggerated, it won't be long before players recognize something is off. The team behind the motion focused on creating natural motions and redid them over and over again. They couldn't imagine their heroine running through the haunted mansion. That felt weird. But calm walking didn't exactly feel right either. It was once again a balancing game. Motion had to be set at a pace that would be scary without stressing the player out. For Shimizu Katsuyuki, however, that wasn't the hardest part. It was the stairs. The house had multiple levels, and the players would be going up and down stairs constantly. Normally, people use stairs without thinking about it. Shimizu realized that when they made their own staircase movements, something was wrong. So he decided to use the stairs, over and over, really concentrating on his movements. He watched how others used the steps at the train station and, over time, eventually developed a method of motion that felt natural. The team behind the motion in the game was a rather large one, led by motion manager Shibata Kohei. While he was considering what field of work to enter as a young man, he thought about what he really enjoyed doing and remembered his childhood spent playing games. So he started looking into video game companies and applied to Tecmo because they were doing well at the time. He was hired in 1998 to work on Deception, and would work on Motion for Fatal Frame alongside seven other employees. Another of these designers was Yoshizawa Yoshikatsu, who worked on Motion for the cutscenes of the game. He was particularly stressed about Miku's motions and expressions, since she was the central character and her emotions were the heart of the CG scenes. How could they express those emotions to the player properly? It was Yoshizawa's first horror game, and he wasn't sure how to make characters look properly afraid, how to make them look as if they're truly suffering. He was constantly aware of that demand, and the fact that if the character didn't look afraid, there was no reason for the player to feel afraid either. But there was also the fear that too much fear could become comical, over-exaggerated. During development, Yoshizawa would sometimes review a scene he'd just finished, only to end up laughing at it. He instructed his fellow motion designers to focus on making it look natural, that they moved like human beings, especially in the movements of their eyes. He worked on the ghost's motions as well, and was heavily involved in all the cutscenes start to finish. These cutscenes were apparently well-liked within the company and highly praised, but if there was even a slight critique or negative opinion, Yoshizawa would discuss each one with the director and the cutscene team, and redo it over and over again. According to Kikuchi, the toughest part of developing the game was the third stage. Describing the order of events himself, he says they began with the pacing of the game, then they created the story, and from that story, the cutscenes, which they disassembled and used for promotional videos. At that time, everything was still entirely in black and white. Then they created the areas of the game, which came across as very realistic. While the characters still had something of an anime touch to them, they kept readjusting the ghost so it wouldn't feel like a puppet show over top the scenery, and continued making these adjustments up until release purposefully adding noise to obscure the picture, so you can only see the areas where your light hits the shadows. We made it so that things would be left to the player's imaginations, Shibata would later say, a technique he then called the aesthetics of subtraction. The first cutscene the team made was shown publicly to the company during a briefing. Everyone watching was taken aback, 
and Kikuchi was very anxious about it. Was the game they were making really okay? Soon after, it debuted in a number of magazines, where responses were mixed between Resident Evil ripoff and looks interesting. Then it debuted at the Tokyo Game Show in 2001, and was received more favorably than anyone had imagined. Up until that point, Tecmo Upper Management had still worried about the project, also asking, Is this okay? in Kikuchi's words. But after the show, they completely pivoted. Kikuchi remembers someone saying to him of the crowds playing the game, Did you see the way the player's eyes sparkled? Before the game's release, Tecmo would arrange a rather unique experience for games journalists. So unique, in fact, that one attendee at the event wrote up a detailed write-up of his experience. One Akira Mark Fujita, a writer at the time for IGN. He and his fellow journalists were taken via limo to the Brookdale Lodge, near Santa Cruz, California, a famous haunted locale and the journalist's home for the next night. The event included multiple sessions of ghost storytelling and history on their haunted home, even watching an episode of Ripley's Believe It or Not that featured the building. There was a Ouija board session, in which a spirit said it was 28Q years old, and a scavenger hunt throughout the many spooky buildings. Tecmo reps attended and led the event, at times adding to the atmosphere by whispering instructions to their guests. But as much as fear was the focus, there was a lot of laughter as well, sometimes at the expense of the spooked. Once they all found the clues and solved the scavenger hunt, they would find a room with Fatal Frame waiting for them, having been primed with real scares before their scary game experience. The journalist who could play the game the longest would receive a prize in the morning, which turned out to be an instant camera. The story ended with the limo ride home and one of the journalists, John Gibson, getting sick and throwing up out the car window. Another article in a magazine from the time reads, I apologize, Zoe Flower. I hope my cookies didn't spill on your coat. That's just one misadventure. A 24-hour period of jet lag, traditional Irish fish and chips, spooky folktales, queasiness, and a sleepless night of gameplay. The game would release in Japan in 2001, with no plans to go global at first. But it wasn't long before the company was actually receiving offers from outside sources asking to publish the game, and it would make its way to North America the next year as Fatal Frame. It would take longer to reach Europe, however, as Tecmo didn't have any publishing infrastructure there at the time, Instead, the French publisher Wanadu Editions bought the rights to it, to major success. The Ring had just released in France around that time, and the game, known as Project Zero in Europe, apparently did some of its best sales there. In North America, the game would release with a unique selling point. A description reading, based on a true story. A press release written for the game would go further with quotes from Shibata Makoto referring to a mansion outside Tokyo which was the inspiration for the game's locale, and a terrible series of murders that happened there, as well as another story about a woman's death in a haunted tree. For years, this real Himuro mansion was the rumored source of the true story, with images of said mansion floating around online, seemingly originating in a 2002 IGN article. Remember when I said Shibata Makoto wasn't lying about seeing ghosts just to sell his game? If he had been, this would have been the best time to do so. This press release and this promotion focused on a true story. But he doesn't mention his own abilities or experiences. Instead, the stories Shibata tells seem to be based on general Japanese folklore, as traced by Lucia at The Ghost in My Machine. On the Japanese side, another blog writer and local Tokyo citizen discussed these rumors, writing that they'd never heard of such a place as Himuro Mansion, not to mention a mansion outside of Tokyo where murders occurred. 
In Japan and elsewhere, the true story angle didn't appear anywhere in marketing, only North America, possibly due to the popularity of Blair Witch and its purported real-world legend. It's likely the advertising department thought to play into that idea with Fatal Frame, coming up with the true story angle with little to no input from Shibata Mikoto. The team had set out to create the most frightening game they could, and they'd succeeded. They'd been told multiple stories of players who'd been utterly unable to finish the game, who'd only progressed about halfway through. It was frightening, and it was quickly shaping up to be a staple of the genre. But it was also a learning curve. It was experimental, and even during development, what the team was doing was so different, they themselves were having to figure it out and change it constantly, altering it down to the last detail. Fatal Frame was the rough draft of a concept they would come to perfect in later years, learning to balance fear and atmosphere with an intense draw that could keep players going. Sales at home would see the game debuting at 15th on the Famitsu charts, selling 21,770 units its first week before falling off the charts. Globally, however, the game would sell 700,000 units in North America, 600,000 units in Europe, with a further 200,000 units from the world leading to over 1.5 million overall. A decent amount of those sales were in South Korea, where the game would receive the big hit label for popular, well-selling games. An article was even published in the New York Times on June 27, 2002, reading, It was the little things that made Frame so scary. The creak of the floorboards, a flashlight throwing spooky shadows against the wall, the mysterious ropes hanging from the ceiling, the pages torn from diaries that describe disturbing rituals and strange disappearances. They'd had no plans for a sequel or a series. They hadn't even been sure the game would work. Kikuchi was afraid it would end up a cult game that made a small splash and vanished. But to their surprise, the game was a hit, especially outside Japan, even receiving an offer from DreamWorks to make a movie adaptation as early as the first game. It wouldn't be made, but the idea went far enough that Kikuchi was meeting with producers in America to discuss a Fatal Frame-themed film. What was the next step? They had built their world, designed their idea of fear. A fear so terrible that many people found the game unplayable. Now they had to refine that fear and create an experience that could both frighten and entice the player right until the very end.